even if it's Waco <laughs> or Oklahoma. Let me ask you a question. What does the wilderness look like to you? Tell me. God, God woods, beautiful, no trees, unaffected by man, quiet, peaceful. What else does the wilderness look like to you? Were any of you ever in the wilderness? I didn't. No. <laughs> what kind of place is the wilderness? Rugged. Rugged. Not backyard. Your backyard. <laughs> Alive. Alive, challenging. Sometimes lonely. Sometimes lonely. Can it be scary? Yeah. Can it be wild? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was amazed at how often the idea of wilderness shows up in the Bible. Now, I've been reading the Bible for a long time. 50, well, I haven't been reading for 52 years, but... For 52 years, I've been hearing Bible stories and reading Bible stories and telling Bible stories. And as I started to do research, there were amazing things that I learned about the wilderness. For example, 235 times in the Old Testament, they talk about going into the wilderness. And we know some of those stories. We know about Moses in the wilderness. When Moses goes into the wilderness, amazing things happen. A bush burns and God speaks to him. He climbs up in the wilderness and onto the mountain and God speaks and he has the Ten Commandments. Then we know about the Jews, the Hebrews journey through the wilderness to, uh, to, to Israel. You know, they left Egypt on a 40-day trip that became 40 years. That's a long walk through the wilderness, isn't it? We also know that wilderness isn't just a place, is it? How many of you have considered yourselves in a wilderness and never left your home? Or never left the confines of your own mind? Because the wilderness is that place that, that seems to be uncontrolled, wild, unfettered. It's that place that, um, quite frankly, most of us don't like to spend very much time there because we're not in control. We're not in charge of what happens in the wilderness. Even in the wilderness of our own lives, it seems like we're not in charge. Isn't that true? And yet, over and over again, we have these stories of the wilderness in Scripture, including the one that was read from Matthew today, where Jesus, Jesus has just had one of those great moments. He was baptized, and that voice from heaven came down and said, this is Jesus, my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. God makes that affirmation, and God sets him up. And as soon as the, the compliment is paid, Mark says, immediately he was taken into the wilderness for 40 days. How many of you know what the word immediately means? Any of you know what, does that mean tomorrow no. or next week? No. It means when? Right now. now. Or as Otto said in the first service, yesterday if we can manage it. <laughs> He's right. We know that when in scripture or in the days of our lives, when things have an immediate need, an immediate response is needed, we don't want to wait till tomorrow. Because tomorrow might be too late. 
So Jesus is taken into the wilderness, and for 40 days, he, he fasts. He doesn't eat anything for 40 days. I forgot to tell you all, by coming to church today, you signed up for the 40-day fast. Yeah. That's the way it kind of goes. Is, no, not me. So Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days. And at the end of the 40 days, he meets the devil. Now this is one of those places where in disciple churches, we all get a little nervous because we're not sure if we actually really believe in a devil or not. I don't care what you call him. Scripture says the devil came to Jesus and said, Hey, look at all these rocks. Why don't you just turn one into a loaf of bread and have lunch? And Jesus looks at him and says, No, no. The, the, the word of God says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word that comes from God. And then he offers him another deal. Jesus says, no. The word of God says not to. And then he gives him even the best deal of all. And Jesus says, no. In fact, I think he said it in King James. He says, get thee behind me, Satan. Or get thee out of here. Because God's word says, you shall worship the Lord your God and him alone. I found it very interesting as I was reading the text that the three temptations that Jesus has given are the same three temptations that we all get to have every day and every time we're in the wilderness. Because the, real, the, the reality is the temptations that the devil brings to Jesus is the same temptation that we all have every single day of our life. And that is the temptation or the question of who's going to be in charge. Is it going to be God or is it going to be me? Is it going to be God or is it going to be my society? Is it going to be God or is it going to be my nation or country or culture? Is it going to be God or something else? Those are the two options when it comes to the priorities of our lives. Who's going to be in charge? And Jesus makes it clear for his mission and ministry, God's going to be in charge. Now, we're not surprised by Jesus being able to say that, but, but, but I know that some of us are thinking about the wilderness of our lives and going, boy, I wish I could do that. I wish I could say, God's going to be in control. God's going to be in charge instead of me. And yet, how many of us hang on to being in control? How many of you like to be in control or think you're in control? I think that's really the question. How many of you like to think you're in control of what's going on around you? Every hand, I, I, I know you all. Even if I've never met you, I know you all. Even those folks in the choir back there that weren't raising their hand. There were a couple. You see, we like to think that we're in control. And what we find out in the wilderness that is our lives, we're really not. Now today we start this journey from wilderness to resurrection. And today we're finding out that the wilderness is actually a great place to do some learning. Now, I know you all like to learn from children. So I have the results of a Sunday school test for young children. Because their, their teacher says, tell me some of the things you've learned this week. She forgot to give them parameters. You should never ask questions that you aren't pretty sure you know kind of what the answers are. Otherwise, you get answers like this. What have you learned today? The little boy says, I learned, well, this week, I learned 
that you can't trust dogs to watch your food for you. <laughs> then there's the little girl, and I thought of you, Linda, for this one especially. The little girl who wrote, you shouldn't sneeze when somebody's cutting your hair. <laughs> the little boy who doesn't particularly care for broccoli says, I learned you can't hide broccoli in a glass of milk. <laughs> Another little girl who, I'm pretty sure that this was more information than her mom really wanted her to share with the um, Sunday school teacher, but says, when your mom is mad at your dad, don't let her brush your hair. <laughs> then there's the little boy. And I'm thinking this little boy was growing up to be a preacher because his answer was that no matter how hard you try, you can't baptize a cat. <laughs> now... In all reality, this is called accelerated learning, what these children were doing. In most of your days, this would have been called learning things the hard way. And have you ever learned anything the hard way? Um, the list of things that we learn the hard way could be really long, couldn't it? And do you ever wonder why we have to learn things the hard way? I've actually had people come up and say, I can't learn anything unless it's the hard way. And I'm going, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, I'm a great believer that if, if, if somebody over here learns that you shouldn't touch the hot plate on the stove because it hurts, when they put their hand on it and they go, ow, I'm not going to do that. Right? You all learned that. Or how many of you reached over and touched the stove? Most of us. You know, so it is with the time in the wilderness. Wilderness time is a great time to learn things. And usually, quite frankly, in the wilderness, we learn things the hard way. But one of the things that happens in the wilderness when we're learning things the hard way is we really do learn what's really important to us. We're in the, when we're in the wilderness of our lives, one of the things that comes out is a higher priority list. Certain things become higher priorities. If you've ever been in the wilderness of sickness, your priority list changes, doesn't it? When you've been in the wilderness of either facing death yourself or being with people who are dying, your priority list changes, doesn't it? If you're normal, it does. Life presents us with so many options today. So many ways to use our resources, our time, our skills. In the wilderness of our lives, we, we learn to focus in on the things that are really important. Patrick Morley, who wrote a book called The Man in the Mirror, likens most people's lives to being the shopper in the grocery store who's hungry. You walk up and down the aisle, and what do you put in your cart? Everything that looks good. And then you get to the checkout stand, and the bill's $427. And you go, I'm in trouble when I bring home the bill to my wife or my husband. In the wilderness of our lives, we find out the things that are really important to us. And, and, and it's like going to the grocery store with that very clear list. And we know exactly what we're there for. And we know what we're exactly there to get. And, and it's like that in the wilderness. Because there's no time for 
deviating from the important things. There's no time to not be in the relationships that are really important to us. There's no time to be fishing around for pieces that don't make any sense. In the wilderness of our lives, I think we understand that those relationships and those obligations and those, those moments are too precious to waste. Wilderness learning experiences oftentimes are very painful because we come face to face with who we are and oftentimes we haven't liked that person. Oftentimes we come face to face with what God has called us to do and we see how far we have gotten off track. Wilderness learning times are times for real stock taking. Asking real questions like, what important relationships and friendships have I been putting off for some time? What is God calling me to do with my life and with all the resources that God has given me? What in my life right now do I take for granted? Have you ever asked that question? What do we take for granted in this life? Well, far too often we take the really most important things in our lives for granted. We just assume that they're always going to be there. We assume that life is going to keep happening the way it's been happening for the last 73 years and we don't have to worry about it. But we even know, even before I finished that sentence, you knew that I was telling a lie. Things aren't always going to be the same, are they? The people we love the most aren't always necessarily going to be right there beside us. We know that life is going to change. What's important to us? Let me tell you a little story to help you focus on that a little bit. There was a fisherman. And he would go out fishing every day. And one day, a businessman came to town and watched him. He saw the fisherman go out, and he saw the fisherman come back in. And so he went over, and he saw what the fisherman came back with. You know, three or four really nice blue, thin tuna. And the, fisherman was, or the businessman was really, really impressed, really. And he says... Wow, how long were you out? And the fisherman says, oh, just a little while. Well, the businessman says, well, what are you going to do with it? And he says, well, I sell some and I eat some and, and I take care of my family with it. And the businessman says, well, you know, I have a, an MBA from Harvard and I want you to know that if you'd have stayed out longer, you could have caught more fish and sold more of them. And the fisherman said, yeah, but what then? The businessman says, well, what do you do with your time? He says, well, I fish a little. I have all my needs met. The businessman says, well, what do you do with the rest of your time? He says, well, you know, funny that you should ask. I sometimes get to sleep late. I thought that was really imperative for today. I play with my children. Sometimes I take a siesta with my wife. And then I stroll into the village each evening where I sip wine and play the guitar and have fun with my friends. I have a full and busy life. The businessman scoffed at him and said, well, you know, I think I can help you. The fisherman says, I'm not sure I need help. He says, well, you know, I think, the businessman says, you should spend more time fishing. And then you could sell the fish you catch 
And with those proceeds, you could buy a bigger boat and you could fish some more. And then you could sell more. And pretty soon you could buy another boat and another boat. You'll have a whole fleet. And then, then you, could, you could build a cannery and not worry about the middleman. And, and pretty soon you, you'd, you'd own this great big company and you'd have to move to Mexico City or to Los Angeles or to, to New York to run your empire. And then when you, when you get a little older and a little you know, bigger, you can, you can sell your company on the stock market and make millions. Millions? How long will this take? The MBA says, well, if you do it the way I tell you to, it'll take 15 to 20 years. But, but you'll be so rich, you won't know what to do with yourself. But what then, the fisherman said? He says, after you've sold your business and made your millions, then you can retire. And you can move to a small coastal fishing village <laughs> where you can sleep late, fish a little, play with your kids, Take a siesta with your wife and stroll to the village in the evenings where you can sip wine and play guitar and be with your friends. You see, we need to start asking those questions in the wilderness of our lives. What really is the most important thing? Where is your life headed? What is your relationship with Jesus like? What are your relationships with your friends and family like? In this season of Lent, it is the time, it is the time of wilderness in the church where we look closely at who we are and what we do and how we live. These are good wilderness questions. And the best part is, we get to answer them. We get to answer them. Amen. Today our hymn of invitation is certainly an invitation for you to make your relationship with Jesus right.